Well, with that small introduction to present value behind us, we're now ready to tackle what we're here for, um, capital budgeting. And we're going to look at two ways to evaluate projects on a go or no-go basis, or if you like, an accept or reject basis. The first is net present value. Then we'll follow that up with the internal rate of return, IRR. But let's focus on net present value uh, for now. I'm going to go through quite a few examples here because we want to make sure that you get it. So if we look at the term net present value, we've already figured out what present value is. So all we have to do is just figure out, well, what's this word in front of it, net? Well, it's net present value equal to the present value of all our inflows minus the present value of all our outflows. So it's the net cash flow that we're looking at. Every project requires us to spend money in order to make money. So all the money coming in, well, that's good. All the money going out, well, that's bad. The question is, as of today, when we take the present value of all the money coming in and all the money coming out and take the difference, the net, is the net present value positive? If it is, it implies that the inflows on a present value basis are greater than the outflows on a present value basis. And if the net present value is greater than zero, accept, else reject. Simple as that. Now you may be wondering, but that doesn't, that just tells us that the cash inflows are greater than the cash outflows, but what about the profitability? Remember now that our discount rate is our required rate of return, is our ROI. That's built into the cash flows. We're discounting these cash flows at that ROI. So anything greater than zero does not imply just greater than zero profitability. It implies a rate of return greater than the rate of return that we want. So even if net present value equals zero, we wouldn't say that there's no profit. That is a confusion sometimes among students saying, well, if the net present value is zero, shouldn't we be indifferent? No, because a net present value of zero implies that the project returns the required rate of return. We are getting all our money back plus our ROI. And I hope to prove that to you in one of the examples that if net present value equals zero, it doesn't mean you're not making any money. It means you're making just the money that you wanted. Anything greater than zero means, hey, this returns more than what we want. All right, so let's look at a, a, an example of how this looks. And I'm going to show you how to enter it into Excel because it's, unless somebody shows you, once, once you see how it's entered into Excel, you go, oh, okay, I get that. That's easy. But if you have to figure it out on your own, it, it can be confusing. So let's assume that we can spend $50,000 today. And in exchange for that $50,000, we get an $18,000 cash flow at the end of every year for five years. Uh, the $50,000 we spend is worth nothing at the end of five years. This is all we get. We're going to trade $50,000 today for five $18,000 payments, each occurring at the end of the year. Does this make sense to do if we want a 20% return? Somebody looking at this might say, well, this is 90000 this is $50,000, i will do it. But hang on a second. If you invested this $50,000 at 20%, would it grow to more than what this could possibly be? You can look at it that way. What we want to do is we want to compare the same dollars. Here is $50,000 today, but we're comparing it with dollars a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, four years from now. We want it all today. So how do we ask Excel to answer this question for us? Well, we type in equals net present value, and um, once you select, uh, you'll get a, a function menu up. We'll show you in a second how that's done. Um, you just enter your terms inside the brackets. The first term is your required rate of return. Notice you have to put a decimal in there. It's not 20, it's 0 0.20. So you do have to put a decimal in there. Put a comma in, and the first term is your first cash flow in one year. Notice you don't put in the negative 50,000 today. You don't put that in because there is no net present value with that. Anything you put in these brackets, Excel assumes that we're discounting at 20%. It's going to assume this is the first one for one period. This is the second period cash flow. This is the third period. The negative 50,000 is actually a zero period cash flow. 
The 18,000 is our first period cash flow. So, point two, 18,000 five times, one, two, three, four, five, close bracket, minus the 50,000. So what we're doing is we're taking the net present value, the present value of all the inflows, this is it here, minus the present value of all the outflows, minus, there's the present value of the outflows, 50,000 minus 50,000. Its net present value is 50,000 because it's now. So once you calculate this, you'll get 53,831 minus your 50,000 equals 3,831. So I said I would show you how to do it in Excel, and here we are. So equals NPV. Notice your function list comes up, and after you type in NPV, there is only one choice. You click on NPV, and your brackets open, and it's saying, okay, tell me some things. Well, we know that our discount rate was 0.2, and notice inside the brackets where it says NPV, the first thing it asks you for is the rate, then it asks you for all the values. So comma, the first value is the amount to be discounted, which is 18,000. 18,000 for the second amount. 18,000 for the third amount. 18,000 for the fourth amount. 18,000 for the fifth amount. Notice that it comes to 53,831. So we just have to enter, we just have to include the minus 50,000 on the end, Excel will return 3,831. Now, some people like to break it up. They don't, they don't want to put it together, and later on I'll show you how, how uh, I'm going to do that. But um, most of the problems I'll solve from now on will have our time zero cash flow just in the cell above. So we'll enter in negative 50,000 in the cell above. Um, this is our uh, net present value of the cash flows, the $18,000 cash flows, and then we'll just do a sum of the two, and uh, if we can uh, make that a dollar sign, we get 380102, which if you take 50,000 off this amount is the same thing. <clears throat> so this would be our, our, our T, uh, our time T0, uh, T0 cash flows, and these are all our other cash flows, so you could just put it in a separate cell, and then just add the two, there you go, net present value with Excel. So, if we're talking about cash flows, we should have an idea of, well, what do you mean cash flows? What, what would qualify as a cash flow? And generally, for cash outflows and cash inflows, we can look at three broad categories. Whenever we're looking at a project, we can classify all of our inflows and all of our outflows into one of these three categories. For the cash outflow, your initial investments. How much are we putting out? How much has to go out today? Um, increased working capital needs. You may start a, 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 an investment, but it may require you to build up some of your assets on your balance sheet as well. You may have to increase dramatically the amount of inventory you carry or increase the amount of short-term cash needed to, to fund certain things. Whatever increase in working capital needs are required, well, it costs money because those are assets. Remember, all assets must be financed either through debt or through equity. All assets must be financed. So any increase in working capital needs above what we already have, got to include that. That's got to be financed. And finally, our periodic payments for either maintenance repairs or operating costs. You can buy a particular uh, um, asset and every three or four years may require certain upgrading or certain maintenance to keep it operational. Well, you have to consider that as part of the, pot, uh, part of the project. That's part of your cash outflow. If you're considering, should I buy a car or should I take the bus? When you buy a car, what are some of your periodic payments? Well, your insurance. That, those are cash outflows. You have to include that. Maintenance on the vehicle, gas expense for the car as well. Those are all periodic payments that are outflows. So your initial investment, and now your initial investment may span several years. You may have to invest a certain amount today, a certain amount a year from now, and a certain amount two years from now, and then a year after that, it starts providing you with positive cash flows. You might have a negative, a negative, a negative, and a positive. These are all considered your initial investment. So there's the typical types of cash outflow. So as we read problems, as we go through problems, we ask ourselves, is that going to be the initial investment? Is that our increase in working capital needs? Do we have any uh, periodic payments that I have to keep my eye open for? But you're looking for these three. Well, it makes sense. 
on the other side for our cash inflows that we're looking at three categories as well. The first category is any increases in revenue or decreases in costs. Remember, we said this is the same thing. I gave you the example of my rent. If I can get it from $2,000 a month down to $1,700 a month, it's the same as making another $300 a month. So any increases in revenues or decreases in costs are positive cash flows. They're cash inflows. Any salvage value associated with any asset we're replacing or, or the salvage value of the asset at the end of its life. If I'm looking at, at uh, uh, buying a new vehicle, part of the cash inflow of that decision is what I can get for my old vehicle because I can sell it and realize cash value. I realize cash today that helps finance the cost of the new vehicle. So that is a cash inflow. So any salvage value, whether it be at the beginning of the term or the end of the term, is cash in. And finally, at the end of the term, if any project we take has an increase in working capital needs, at the end of the project, there'll probably be a release of working capital. So we have to pay attention to that. If we have an increase, we have to have a decrease. Now, somebody may say, but if it's increasing and then it's decreasing, isn't that just the same thing? Like why, if we're looking at incremental approach or differential costs, wouldn't we just ignore that? Ah, hang on a second now. You would ignore it if it happens at the same time. But time has value. So an increase in working capital today and a decrease of working capital a year from now are two very different cash flows. The increase in working capital today has a present value of whatever it is today. The release of working capital a year from now has a much different present value today. So you can take the difference between the two present values, which is nothing more than net present value. So that should give you a good handle on what net present value looks like. Let's cover off a few more issues and then uh, we'll jump right into some examples. Music